This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources. Consistent with its running right process, Alpha is an energy company committed to being a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. We fuel progress around the world. More information at alphanr.com. Haley Buick GMC. The place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. On Midlothian Turnpike in Richmond and online at haleybuickgmc.com. Taking it to the streets and helping our community. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at vachamber.com. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a very special welcome to Delegate Keith Hodges. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we were talking before we started the show that Chris Jones, Delegate Chris Jones, is a pharmacist. Yes, sir. You serve in a seat that, as I was looking uh, for now for 35 years, has been represented yes, by a pharmacist. That's that's somewhat unique. That is that is Former correct. Delegate Harvey Morgan, who served for about 30 of those years. 32, actually. 32. 32 years. And now you completing your second term. Uh, uh, four years. Yes, sir. And uh, appreciate your being on to talk about any number of issues. First, why don't you tell the viewers about the uh, area of the Commonwealth that you represent and some of the major issues, then we'll get into some pharmacy issues. Certainly. Um, thank you first for, for having me here. Yes. And I represent the 98th District, which is Virginia's middle peninsula, so Gloucester, Matthews, Middlesex, King and Queen, Essex, and part of King William. And it, it's six counties and three towns. So we have Urbana, Tappahannock, and West Point within the district as, as well. Um, it's what I call the, the best part of the Commonwealth, living, living there all of my life, growing up there. My wife is from there. I married my high school sweetheart. And um, I just love the, the, the people in the Middle Peninsula. And it's a quality of life like nowhere else in the, in the Commonwealth. But we also have our challenges as well. And economic development mm. is my number yes. one priority in, in the um, in the Middle Peninsula. You know, growing up there, I lived next door to my grandparents. My wife, and my high school sweetheart, she lived next door to her grandparents. And it, it really hit me. I have a 15-year-old daughter, a 10 and 15-year-old daughter, and we were talking about her college, you know, her, her future um, college plans and, and her career when she graduates from college. And it really hit me then that we don't have the opportunities in the Middle Peninsula for, for our young people to return. 71% of the workforce in the Middle Peninsula drives outside of the district to work each and every day. 71? 71%. It's a challenge like nowhere else in, in, in Virginia. And we're really in the, in the cradle of the urban crescent. So in the western part of the district, folks are driving to Fredericksburg, northern Virginia, to Richmond. And then as, as you move east, they're driving to Richmond and to Hampton Roads to work. And it leaves behind a workforce the folks that actually live and work in the district, we have the lowest wages in the state, in the Commonwealth. With the SEDS report, the recent SEDS report from the Middle Peninsula, we have 50 employers with only 50 or more employees within the six counties and three towns. Riverside Health Systems, we're, we're fortunate to have a great health system with two hospitals and a network of physicians in, in the district. They're, they're the largest employer. Uh, Gloucester County Schools is number two. Walmart, with two big box Walmarts, is the third largest employer. And the paper mill in West Point, West Rock, is the fourth largest employer. Then after that, you're looking at um, you know, fast food, retail sector, and then, and then healthcare as well. But 
15 of those 50 localities that I, there are 15 um, employers are government entities, leaving behind 35 employers with 50 more employees. So we're challenged in that when Richmond and Washington, when they look at the Middle Peninsula and they look at our average wage, it's, you know, it's fairly good. But when you look at the folks that actually live and work and where they spend their money each day, when they drive outside of the locality, that's where they spend their money. And I've actually found myself looking at the back of cars now to see where the folks in the Middle Peninsula buy their vehicles. Mm -hmm. So when they travel outside of the district, they spend their money, they shop, and it, it's a challenge for, for our local governments to, to generate tax revenue, and it's a challenge for the, our, our youth to return and to, to work within the Middle Peninsula. All of our school systems, for the most part, are either holding steady right now or losing students. We're, we're actually losing population in the Middle Peninsula. Our, we've had a school system that's closed. Gloucester County closed the school. And our, mm -hmm. most of our school systems are losing, um, losing children within their, their school systems because we, we, we don't have the jobs for people to, to live there and, and to work within the Middle Peninsula. So um, it, it is a challenge, but we're working, working on this. Um, I held the Middle Peninsula Economic Development Summit last fall, and, and we had representation from public, private sector. We had um, state uh, participated as well. Secretary Jones, Secretary Haymore were, were both present. present. And uh, we talked about the challenges uh, that, that are within the, the Middle Peninsula. We talked about the opportunities as well. And uh, it was a great, great, um, great program. And one of, one of the, the things that came out of that was regional cooperation. The Middle Peninsula is one of the only areas of the state where we don't have regional cooperation between our localities for economic development. So we have been working on, on this over the, over the last few months held meetings with our localities. Um, they are working very hard to, 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 to develop an economic development organization of some type. So it's, it's, it's actually, as a legislator, it's not up to me. I'm facilitating this, and it's up to yes, them on how right. they, they, they would like to proceed with regional cooperation, but still maintain their, their local ad identity as well. So we, we do have our challenges, but we are, uh, we are working on, on this very hard in the Middle Peninsula. You know, as, as you describe it, it sounds like similar in, in many ways to Southside Virginia, to Southwest Virginia. Um, but in some of those portions of Southside and, and Southwest, there's uh, been tobacco revitalization sure. money that's helped. And I don't, you didn't mention it, but I don't know that tobacco has grown in sure. that much in the Middle <laughs> Peninsula where there would be really, it's not in the footprint where there's that kind of assistance for sure. economic it, development. And that is a challenge that, that we've talked about. So that type of assistance is not available yes, to us in, right. in the Middle Peninsula. And we're kind of between Hampton Ridge and, and we're between Richmond. And we, over the years, we've, we've lost our identity as well. So we need to, to maintain, well, we need to focus on who are we? What do we want the Middle Peninsula to be? Where do we want to, to have that focus? And it's up to the localities to, to do this. We, um, I think we, we can do this. Uh, we've had some excellent discussions. And in the end, you know, the, the assistance, it does help. But I do believe that all of the localities, I guess, have to have some skin in the game to, to make this work. That's the only way to, to really move forward and to make this work. But we're having great discussions right now. Um, we've had three meetings so far with the localities. And we have a fourth planned in August. Mm. So hopefully at the end of the day, we will, we will have um, an organization that uh, within the Middle Peninsula for economic development. Uh, the state has been, and Secretary Jones and his office, Secretary Haymore and his office, have been there every step of the way to, to offer their assistance as well and, and to serve as a resource. Well, beyond your strong concerns about the region of the Commonwealth you represent, uh, as a pharmacist, You've been involved in some, some of the hot issues here at the General Assembly, uh, the prescription drug and, and heroin abuse. Uh, just before we were having the time to tape this show, I was hearing that 43,000 people die a year in the U.S. and with drug overdoses or, or from abuse, 120 a day. I don't know how many of those are in the Commonwealth, but it, but it is a problem nationwide and something that's being addressed by, by the group that you're working on. 
Yes, sir. And it, actually, prescription drugs, you know, 30 years ago, we, we rarely heard of heard about the prescription drug overdoses that we hear about today. It, it is an epidemic across the nation and in the Commonwealth. In the last 10 years, prescription drug overdoses have doubled in the Commonwealth in the last 10 years, and heroin overdoses have doubled in the last two years. When I graduated from pharmacy school, I, I, I remember well the number of what we call Schedule II drugs, um, the oxycodones, the hydrocodones, and, and the, the morphine derivatives in a small drawer in the pharmacy. Now, it's the, the inventory that we carry in, in the pharmacy is uh, it's a lot more than that. Um, we are working with, with the governor. The governor, through an executive order, created the, the Prescription Drug and Heroin Abuse Task Force and appointed me to serve on that task force. Uh, we have worked on legislation to, to introduce into the session and developing a work plan. Last year in the 2000, well, this past session in the 2015 session, um, legislation was introduced to um, assist individuals, to assist families, and assist the firefighters and EMS with administering naloxone. Mm -hmm. And naloxone is a medication that can either be given through, given nasally, or through an injection, an auto injector, to reverse the, the overdose of the opioid derivatives, which are the, the number one, our number one cause of accidental um, prescription overdoses. So it reverses that. And there were pilot programs in the Commonwealth. There were one pilot program started in North Carolina. We had those pilot programs in Virginia, which that was created through legislation. And it showed that these pilot programs and these individuals having access to the naloxone saved lives. So that was one great piece of legislation um, that, that was introduced and passed this, this past session. I had um, legislation that um, will help with hospice patients mm -hmm. and the families mm -hmm. with hospice. When you or I were to get a prescription filled for what we call a Schedule II medication, if we get part of that prescription, that's all we can get. So if it's written for 100 and we get 30, we cannot get the, the 70 filled at a later time. The DEA, in order to, to keep a lot of medication mm -hmm. out of the home, a few years ago the DEA said for hospice patients you can fill partial quantities. So if, if the, the, the hospice patient who's enrolled in a hospice program is not expected to live but maybe a few more days or for a week, they can get a smaller quantity and then get those other quantities filled at a later time. So it keeps a lot of medication out of the home. And that's where, that's, a, that's where most of the diversion comes from with these medication is it comes from out of the home. So it was, it was a, a good policy that was set by the DEA, but the problem occurs when the patient passes away and those refills are still remaining. So we were seeing instances where friends or family members would try to get the medication filled at a later mm -hmm. time. I actually had a 15-year-old boy whose father had passed away and he was in the pharmacy the following day trying to get the medication filled again. So we'll, the legislation that I passed will help prevent that from occurring. So hospice now will notify the pharmacy within 48 hours when the patient passes away if they have any of those partial quantities remaining. And so it will help keep the medication out of the wrong hands. And probably living in an area such as you live, you probably knew that even sure. before hospice told you, but if, if that were in a major metropolitan area, unless hospice got word to a pharmacist, someone at a big chain pharmacy here in the city of Richmond wouldn't know that. Correct. And, it, and that can happen at, you know, everywhere, but we, we have an ex ex excellent relationship with our, with our hospice nurses. and they always call and, and let us know when a patient passes away. But that can happen, and we did see that when we surveyed and talked to pharmacists around the state, we, we found that that was, was happening. So we, we, in the end, hospice, they were wonderful to work with. The, um, the board with, with the hospice, hospice folks were great partners in this moving forward. Um, and we were able to sit down and iron all the kinks out. At the That's end of great. the day, it, it worked out. So uh, it's, it's a good bill. That's, and it will help great. save lives. Yeah. Now, what about those drugs that are in the medicine cabinet that uh, people aren't taking? Uh, 
I myself have had occasion where I would get a prescription and I would take one or two pills for something and the, oh, I don't need any more, and so it's, mm -hmm. it stays there. I've, I've heard you shouldn't uh, put them through the, flush them down. Well, that's should, actually a no-no. Um, yes. you, you know, so the, you shouldn't do that. So what, what do you do to clear out those drugs? Well, Schedule Six medications, the non-controlled medications, many pharmacies actually can take those and destroy them for you. There, there's a program where they go into a, a, a HIPAA-compliant container where you can't reach in and, and grab it, and that's sent away and incinerated. The problem is, is the controlled medications, pharmacies can't do that. The DEA mm. used to hold take-back programs in conjunction with local law enforcement. They would hold these programs throughout the state and take the controlled medications back. The DEA has now stopped those programs and left it up to, now leaving it up to the states to implement these programs. So this is something we're looking at within the, the governor's task force on prescription drug and heroin abuse, how to destroy, of the, destroy these medications appropriately. Um, so we're working with law enforcement to have these lockbox and you know lockbox um, sites throughout the state mm -hmm. and local law enforcement and possibly pharmacies. So the board of pharmacy is now at look, looking at the regulations um, to promulgate regulations for take backs and looking at ways to effectively take them back. Because I think as, as you and I were talking before we started the show, that, that some of that abuse can take place just by something that. Some of us leave in the medicine cabinet sure. and someone happens to be in the house and, and gets their hands on those and, and abuses them. Correct. Uh, most of the, the medication that you see on the street comes from a friend or family member. Uh. So the, in, folks leave it on the medicine cabinet, it mm -hmm. stored in their medicine cabinet, which is the, the worst place to store your medicine. It's hot and humid. And then when someone is in your home behind closed doors, they can open the medicine cabinet and it's right there. So the third cousin, someone you know, working on your home doing construction work or working on the plumbing and you know, or HVAC, they would have access to that medication. Uh, storing the medication out of sight, either in a lockbox or somewhere out of sight, will help prevent a lot of, of the deaths that we're seeing and a lot of the drug overdoses that we're seeing because that's where most of the mm -hmm. medication comes from. We're, we, you know, we leave it laying in our pocketbook. We, we just don't think about it. Right. Um, and it's, it's right there. You just, there are actually children, um, teenagers, we, they, they call them farming parties with a pH, where they will take any medication they can find and, and pour it into a bowl mm. and grab a handful Scary. and take it. And it's, it's causing, um, causing deaths yes. and permanent injuries to, to, to these these well, kids. well, this task force that you're on, I noticed that it has a meeting scheduled toward the end of September, yes, and people can go on the calendar and the governor's side or the General Assembly side if they want to attend that. There's also a Substance Abuse Advisory Council, which is apart from that, and I think you serve on it as well. So it's doing some additional work? Yes, sir. The Substance Abuse Service Council, which the Speaker appointed me to when I was first elected. Um, we, this past year, and actually the past two years, we have been looking at marijuana. In, in Virginia, the pros and cons of marijuana. We've been looking at, at other states to see what the challenges mm -hmm. that they, they have had. Um, there was legislation that Delegate Albo introduced this past year that deals with just the cannabidiol oil, which is has n none of the, the properties, yes. the hallucinogenic right. properties. It, it, it doesn't make you high, and it's used in seizures. That, that piece of legislation, actually, it was a good bill because it will allow individuals access to the oil, oil if, if they're in possession of that oil in the Commonwealth and, and have a recommendation from a physician, they will not be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. um, it, unlike what they call the THC oil, which, and that's what mm -hmm. makes, you, makes you high, mm -hmm. um, there, there are drug manufacturers that are doing a lot of research and they have medication in, in drug studies at this time. One is looking with just the cannabidiol oil mm -hmm. with epilepsy. There are also drugs that, that have a combination of this CBD oil along with THC oil to use in MS. So there are things in the pipeline. Um, they've they've, they've uh, put a lot of resources into these studies. And there, we may see something on the market very soon and approved in the United States with just the cannabidiol oil. There are already two medications on the market that have the THC
component, and that's used for nausea with chemotherapy patients. Mm. So those are already on the on right. the market, and they're they're used not very often, but they but they are used. The challenge that I have as the way I look at it as a pharmacist, legislative bodies approving marijuana for a particular indication, that opens a can of worms that we really don't want to open. I don't know of anywhere else where a legislative body has approved a particular medication for a, 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 a particular use. So if a, a legislative body approves marijuana for epilepsy, for seizures, you know, for uncontrollable pain, what would then stop a drug manufacturer from coming to the General Assembly and saying, hey, we want to approve this medication in Virginia for this particular indication. So uh, we, we have a process with the FDA to, mm -hmm. and we need to go through that process to ensure that medications are safe and effective. Well, again, it's par partially because of the region of the Commonwealth you represent, but strong interest and involvement in groundwater issues and stormwater issues. So in our closing minutes, tell, tell our viewers some about what's happening in those two arenas. Sure. Groundwater, um, we talk about gas, we talk about oil, we talk about electricity all of the time, but we don't talk about water. And yes. that is our most valuable natural resource. We turn the spigot on, the water is there. And the electricity can go off, my wife is fine <laughs> for a little while, but if the water's not on, oh, yes. she's going to panic. Currently, in areas east of 95, we're in the Eastern Virginia groundwater management area. So any private or public user over 300,000 gallons a, a month is issued a permit by DEQ. Mm. Over 90% of industry, individuals, municipalities, they get their water from the Potomac Aquifer. The, this is a deep aquifer, thousands of feet below the surface and is being depleted at an unprecedented rate. When you ask the experts how many years we have before we're in panic mode, well, they say, well, in the western part of the, the district, they say 10 years. In the eastern part of the district, probably 25 to 35 years where the, the aquifer is wider. But it, it's, mm. they really can't tell you exactly, but we do know we need to do something very soon or we're going to be in a, in a crisis situation down the road. And what, what I call the water calendar, when you look at that, 10, 15, 25 years is not a very long time. When you look at what Newport News and King William with that, that's lasted how long? 20, 25 years? And we need to look at, um, look at everything in the, as, as far as access to surface water, desalination, we need to look at all of these things. This past session, I introduced two pieces of legislation. One was a JLARC study to look at water resource and planning throughout the Commonwealth. And the second is what it, it creates the Eastern Virginia Groundwater Advisory Committee. So it's public and private sector, um, folks with um, expertise in, in water, water management. And it pulls together the public and private sector to come up with a solution because people, people were saying, Keith, what is the government going to do to fix this? And then the free market, you know, in me says, all right, the, the, it's up to the private sector, the municipalities to fix this. So in thinking about it, it's somewhere in, in between. So what this committee will do, it will pull all these folks together, put them in a room and put them, you know, make them play nicely together to come up with, with solutions. So we'll look at all, the, all of these things, you know, access to surface water, desalination, injection back into the, to the, to the ground to, to stop the flow of the water and the depletion mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of, of the groundwater. It gets very, very, very complicated. Um, and I've learned a lot about water as, as I started to, to look at this. But um, we need to come up with, with solutions and hopefully this will will pull everyone together. Now it's important to have the JLARC study and the legislation right. because of the timing. Yes. The, the JLARC study will feed very valuable information to the committee as it moves forward to, to, do, to do their work. So hopefully in the, in the long run, we'll, we'll come up, these folks will come up with a solution. They're going to be winners and losers. Uh, and everyone that is sitting down at the table to come up with a solution, they realize that. And um, if we're looking at economic development, mm. yes. if, if you don't have water, you have absolutely nothing. And one statistic that was very alarming is 97% of the water on the earth, we have an abundance of water, on the earth, 97% is salt water. 
2% is either at the North or South Pole in glaciers, leaving only 1% to be used for human consumption. And the body is made up of, I need to, to think back, 60, about 60% 60 water. Your blood is about 92% water. Your bone is about 22%. Your muscles about 75%. So we can uh, talk about if we have, yes. we don't have water, we have absolutely nothing. Delicate Hodges, so. our time is running out. But we <laughs> thank you so much for being on This sure. Week in Richmond. We look forward to having more conversations with you. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Pleasure. sir. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. Haley Buick GMC, in Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.